that's a really interesting part of the book. Let's go there. Um, the, the, I think you're referring to the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act. Is that right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what was that? And uh, <laughs> it was awfully audacious. Uh, it was, what, indeed. What were they trying to do with that? Well, th- this went back. There were several versions of this, um, and it actually goes back to, um, you know, the uh, some of the social justice budgets ideas of the 60s. Um, and the idea was to, and I, I run this by my students and just watch their heads sort of spin around the idea. <laughs> the idea was a federal guarantee of a job. And this that, is as recent as the 70s. This is remarkable to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually it passed, which is, you know, in a deformed way. But that's how popular it was. They felt the need to actually pass this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so the idea, the, the concept was sort of bringing individual rights, okay, that's, that's what we're about. Okay, now you may have the right to a job, um, the right to employment. And the idea would be that, that, that macroeconomic planning would not just be about servicing Wall Street's interests, but actually about creating full employment. And the last resort, if you didn't have a job, is you could appeal to the federal government um, for a job. Including by suing them, taking them to court. Yeah, yeah, you could actually, right. The original <laughs> draft of the bill said you could sue the federal government for a job if you didn't have one. And but the, but the idea was to avoid that by having a series of you know right. uh, occupational centers where you could go and get a job if you needed one and things like this. And, and um, it was it was basically a different vision for how uh, economics would work. And it was the the there were different sponsors, but the main ones we remember are Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was vice president under Johnson, and Augustus Hawkins, who was. Uh, the congressman from Watts, and it is started in '74, uh, was brought up for vote in '76, and ultimately uh, Carter embraced it in sort of this tepid, mm, vague way because he was sort of afraid of it. Um, but ultimately, it's hard to imagine, but it passed uh, in 1978. By the time it passed, though, it was so changed and watered down, and like it was basically a full employment bill in name only. It was um, full of all sorts of austerity stuff and 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 um, pretty much empty. Uh, it was it was it was gutted before it was it was it was uh, its final vote came up. But there's there's that moment in the seventies and that's what's interesting about the seventies is like things are pushing multiple directions. We tend to see it as a sort of this pre eighties moment where everybody's getting conservative and there's this backlash against the state and against civil rights by white people and all this stuff. But actually, it's going multiple ways. Uh, it's, 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 you know, there's, I, I, I call the beginning of my book Hope and the Confusion, and the second half of the book I call Despair and the Order, um, because I think that moment of sort of bringing together the 60s rights consciousness and the 30s econ- collective economics consciousness in the first half of the 70s is really promising. It just, it just doesn't take root, and then and then you sort of begin to see the roots of the neoliberal order uh, by the end of the seventies. Yeah, and let's. Um, I don't. How much time do you have today? I'd like to um, talk about a few other topics. If you, yeah, if you have sure. Time. No, I'm, I'm available. Great. Yeah, I'm enjoying this conversation. So, uh, I would like to go to President Carter. I think there's this perception nowadays that. Um, Ronald Reagan really represents the rise of the sort of new uh, neoliberal uh, conservative order in America in American history. But um, you talk about how Carter really represents the f- uh, the first democratic incarnation of that, and also that he was the first president of the post New Deal order. Can you explain that? Yeah, which is <clears throat> which is interesting. It throws Nixon in with, with the liberals. That's right, and Carter with the conservatives. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I basically say the Reagan era began in late 1978. I think, um, you know, which is um, obviously a bit of a play on the whole idea of the Reagan era because Reagan hadn't been elected yet, and really nobody even thought he would ever would be elected. <laughs> you know, there's a there's this scene in All in the Family where uh, Archie Bunker kids that that you know when Ronald Reagan gets elected, this will all be solved, and it was supposed to be a punchline because <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever really believed. That guy would become president um so but yeah no so so you have this time of you know we were talking about economic structural crises at the beginning of our conversation and these are moments of reconfiguration and you know uh where things are up for grabs and i think the the theme of staying alive is that one set of ideas are defeated and another set 
uh, are, are grab control. And I think Carter is a really interesting transitionary figure because I think he could have gone multiple ways. I mean, he was really kind of a technocrat. We know that. And he wasn't a, a visionary leader in, in a lot of ways. But I actually think... Uh, he he was swayable in a lot of a lot of things and and but what eventually something has to be done about inflation right that's the mm. economic crisis of the day and there are a lot of different ideas about it, including his um secretary of labor is, is is giving a completely different reason for explaining inflation and basically says if we you know if we if we employ more people inflation's going to go away um but the, but Carter begins to listen to Volcker and people like this, and 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 then he, he uh, de- begins deregulating uh, things, uh, uh, and, and appoints Volcker to the Fed, and 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 you begin to see this sort of compromise uh, begin the the crumbling of the um, of the New Deal paradigm, and really I think I think um, 1978 is really this key year where it falls apart. Humphrey Hawkins is passed but in this gutted way labor law reform is up um and it looks like it's going to pass but uh, for lack of two vote votes to get over a filibuster it it goes down um and uh because the unions are already in trouble at that point they need this legislation and to make a long story short the defeat of those ideas really kind of opens up the space for for the for these New thinkers who are really the old thinkers, right? Mm-hmm. They're, the, they're they're bringing the the the, the pre New Deal ideas uh, uh, to bear, and, and and I think what that means is that when Reagan is running against him, he's just going to do a better job at that stuff than Carter is, right? I mean, if you want to deregulate, it, sure, vote for Reagan. He's going to do a better job than Carter. Probably, he's going to get job done. Um. So so what happens is there's not a really crystal clear alternative coming out of the Carter administration. Um, it's a highly compromised political alternative in 1980. And, and even a lot of the, uh, a lot of people are, you know, sort of in this any, anybody but Carter mood uh, at that point. And, and, and we even know from polling, though, that nobody actually, not nobody, but it, a majority of people did not support Reagan's policies, but they liked the idea of Reagan. You know, this mm. something was strong, powerful, and do it right, not the sort of waffling, kind of trying to have it both ways figure of, of Jimmy Carter, who I have respect for in a lot of ways, but, but mm-hmm. not in his, uh, certainly not in his uh, labor and social policies. It does seem to be the moment when all of these competing, uh, at times contradictory elements of the Democratic Party finally pull it apart. And right. then, and it sort of remains apart until you have Bill Clinton c- come and, and put it together in a new neoliberal fashion. Right. Yeah, um, the new democratic, right? Yeah, which is really unfortunate. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about political strategy too, because when we're talking about the demise of the working class um, in this country, the Republican Party has really found great success. Uh, and perhaps to a lesser extent, the Democratic Party, uh, the more contemporary Democratic Party as well, but great success in focusing on issues of cultural values rather than material concern. And that helped sort of divide and undermine the labor movement. And uh, a lot of people probably look at Reagan as sort of the the herald of this particular uh, kind of strategy. But you talk a lot about how Nixon really developed this strategy uh, and employed it first. Can you can you explain a little bit about what his thinking was around that line? Yeah, sure. Uh, Nixon is a such you know he's he's the you know sort of the id of the American psyche, uh, <laughs> fascinating guy. But he, I actually think you'd have to go one layer further, which is he learned from George Wallace. Mm. Um, George Wallace, the uh, governor of Alabama, uh, who ran for president in '68 and '72, and really kind of divided the Democratic Party. As an independent, sixty-eight as a Democrat in seventy-two. Um, really, and Wallace got up there and argued about you know race and you know the cultural elitists, and which which is very close to the economic elites, right? Which is but it's different. Even today, when we say you know you hear about the liberal elite, you're talking about people who actually don't have all that much power. You're talking about professors and actors and you know have some cultural power, but they don't have actual economic power. Well, you know, the old populace, they were talking about bankers and railway, railway magnates and things like this. Mm-hmm. So 
the economic critique in the late 60s and early 70s began to flip towards a cultural critique. And Reagan watches Wallace very carefully and says, wow, this is the path. And so he really tries to con- very, very consciously, uh, I, I learned when I, you know, I went through miles of correspondence within the Reagan, uh, excuse me, within the Nixon archive, very conscious, explicit strategy to try to make, to, to shift politics away from economics to culture and to try to make the Republican Party the the, the uh, sort of a, a successor to the Democratic coalition, the, to the uh, Roosevelt coalition. Mm-hmm. And he does this by basically saying, we're going to, our, our, our glue will be conservative culture, just the way their glue was economic rights. And he, he really does an, quite a good job at this, I think. You know, and the war helps him, uh, the rise of, you know, the, the, the you know, urban violence helps him. A lot of, a lot of things help him fuse his message. Um, but it's amazing how very consciously and explicitly he did it. And he won the majority of high school educated uh, voters, manual workers, Catholics, you know, a lot of metrics we use to think about what a working person is. He won them all in 1972. And I really think he created the Reagan coalition in 1972. It's just he, you know, screwed up. Right. And got fired. So why why Jeff did this work? I mean, material concerns, <laughs> they're so immediate and so obvious. Um was it was it the 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 race issue really at the root of this? What, yeah, race and then by, by the time Reagan comes along it's it's you know, immigration as well. Um Yeah, um it, it, you know, Tip O'Neill said politics in America is about who hates whom and um that's I, 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 sort of what I'm beginning and you know, playing with in this in this book, uh, this one that's coming out, and <clears throat> it's it, it's a sad thing. It's it's just it it's it's very easy to dissolve a coalition. It's very hard to build one, and the the powers that be that are interested in dissolving a working a coalition of working people are very very powerful. And you know we used they used to bring in the national guard and you know, on horseback and start just clubbing people and shooting people. There's a little bit of that going on today, but now it's it's actually a much more sophisticated uh, cultural program that, 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 you know, talks freedom, talks, you know, about subtly about white privilege, ta- you know, whether it talks about, um, you know, the great heritage of the American Revolution, the Tea Party, even if it's in this twisted, you know, cartoonish version of it, and those 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 solvents tend to dissolve these these, these coalitions that are very hard to build. It's it's easier to make an argument about hating people in the abstract than it is, uh, you know, forming solidarity uh, uh, in, a, in a in a national, let alone international. Way and 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 I think that's kind of something we need to think about. It's because you know it's easy to say what we should do, but it's harder to sort of imagine ways to do it. And there's a million. Let me be clear. I know there's your listeners, others go. Oh, I got a million examples of of where this has worked. <laughs> Cross border co- coalitions and community organizing that have gone to the state and you know all sorts of great things. And it's true. They're all out there. But by and large, <clears throat> the only time those groups won and won really big and in a way that really transformed American politics is between the 30s and the 70s. Hmm. Well, and so um, turning to moving forward, while looking back, you sort of argue in the essay that you sent me, and I suspect in The Great Exception as well, that um, we need to look less at re- rebuilding sort of the, the New Deal approach to politics and more towards sort of the pre-depression, pre-trauma outlines of a progressive style of politics. What do you mean by that? What, is, what would yeah, that constitute? Yeah. I'm glad you raised that. Um, the, so this goes back to what I was saying, how the New Deal sort of creates this, this mountain or this obstacle where you can't really see what went, be- what went before because you're really sort of focused on that one big success story. How do we get back to that? You know, And, you know, you, you mentioned... Uh, Robert Rice and stuff, and uh, I think it was uh, Paul Krugman who referred to uh, Obama as, as uh, Barack Delano Obama or something like this. And um, just 
it just messes with our imagination. I think if we leap over that and go back to the Progressive Era, which is loosely the period between 1901 and 1917, you see something different. Um, and there's problems there too, don't get me wrong. But uh, I think you see, rather than large political blocks, that you create in the New Deal era. You see these shifting coalitions. Um, one historian of the Progressive Era said it was very kaleidoscopic. Things are moving, alliances are being created, uh, uh, you know, religious groups are aligning with unions, unions are aligning with women's groups, women's groups uh, are aligning, you know, working women's groups are aligning with rich women's groups. It's all sort of uh, uh, shifting and breaking and, and um, um, coming together in different ways. And I think that's more like what we're going to see today. Um, it did not radically uh, transform the division of wealth in America, which was pretty high. But it did create tremendous regulation uh, of corporations, it did provide new rights, you know, the women, and it did talk about industrial democracy and things like this. And I, and I think the sort of plurality of ideas and the laboratories on the city and state levels that we see in the progressive era are all much richer than just sort of waiting for the next FDR to, uh, to save us. And I think it returns a certain sense of, of, of agency to regular people mm in the sense that, oh, okay, well, I'm going to start here. You know, I'm, going to, I'm not going to just, you know, pull the lever for the next president that I think is going to save us all. You know, Hillary's going to, going to pull us through. No, I think, you know, we're going to start here in, this, in my town, and I'm going to figure out what I can do here and change this. And I'm going to change, you know, maybe work on the state level, and, and you'll begin to see some, some transformations that maybe will build. Um, and it's, it's the old formula, bottom up, not top down. That's right. And if there's a theme that runs through all of the shows that we've done here in the soapbox, that seems to be it. Um, and so, you know, you talk, for example, about how, you know, these diffuse power structures of the progressive era were um, criticized for as one of its failings. But, right. you know, and Occupy was criticized for the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Because they didn't have leaders. Um, but, you know, this and this goes back to the question of, Unions and the failure of unions, but I, I wonder if you know that sort of institutionalized hierarchical power structure doesn't inevitably lead to excess and or abuse, and and wouldn't we be a little bit wiser to look to some of these more diffuse power structures? Yeah, that's you know what <clears throat> what union leaders call or not excuse me uh, sociologists call the iron law of oligarchy. Um, things always just organizations tend to become oligarchic um, and. Um, there's few, few uh, institutions that, that, that manage to escape this. So yeah, I, that's, no, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more concrete agenda come out of uh, out of Occupy, um, but I think that kind of thing is absolutely right. It's it's we we're at a point now where we need to let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, we need this kind of experimentation and Occupy changed the discourse, right? We now, mm-hmm. for better or for worse, we talk about the 1% and the 99%. I'm not sure that's a great class formulation, but <laughs> it's okay. You know, we're talking about something we weren't talking about before. And I think that's an invaluable contribution. And, you know, it, it really emanated from this, you know, this group of people in this park in New York and then spread all over the place. It was, it was great. And, and I think uh, that kind of thing... Um, that will probably grow outside of formal institutional structures and outside the state and things like that might are probably the most promising things to look at. I mean, you could organize a union there. It's going to cost you millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, basically, mm-hmm. to organize a union. It's, it's so hard, so expensive, so legally on the edge of things um, that I think... The areas we're going to see growth in are, say, municipal minimum wage campaigns, workers' rights centers, um, this, you know, th- things like Occupy, um, uh, things that will begin to um, um, push and squeeze uh, in a different 
different ways, but, but, but tend to be quite grassroots. I'm, I'm afraid, you know, I, 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 some people labor organizing today are, are, are absolute heroes and, and they should be respected. Um, but I'm not always convinced that's really going to be where the change is going to come. I think uh, it will come, but labor is going to have to make a coalition with the fast food workers. The fast food workers are going to have to make co- with uh, with with local religious groups, and they're going to have to make they're all going to have to make a coalition with the environmental groups, and um, and I, and it's going to be much more fluid and much more contingent and uh, and much more fluid than anything we've seen in the past. Well, I think that's uh, as good a place as any to uh, stop for today. Thank you very much, Jefferson Cowie, for uh, joining me here on the Soapbox. My pleasure, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I look forward to reading uh, The Great Exception coming out later this fall.